My name is Dr. Billy Wu. This is my 14th year here at Imperial College. I did undergrad, PhD, postdoc, and uh, academic position here. So maybe one day I'll, uh, I'll leave, but uh, for the time being, it's a very good place to be. And the title of my talk is It's Not Easy Being Green. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about electric vehicles and batteries, which is uh, a lot of my research. Uh, and some of the things which hopefully will provoke some conversations, which Bill and I will have a conversation after this, fireside chat style, but hopefully we get lots of audience engagement as well. So that's the aim of what we hope to achieve. So a quick plug of our research group here at Imperial. Uh, I co-lead the Electrochemical Science and Engineering Group. We work at the interface between fundamental science and engineering application of energy storage devices. So things like lithium-ion batteries, which power your mobile phones, laptops, electric vehicles, and hopefully large-scale grid batteries. But we are also interested in other technologies like hydrogen fuel cells, which is actually coming back into popularity. Uh, hydrogen is one of the most abundant elements in the universe. It literally comes out of our taps uh, in the form of water. And there's huge potential for using that technology to decarbonize uh, our electrical grid and other transport vectors. And other technologies like supercapacitors, which give us great power or acceleration of our electric vehicles. And then underpinning all of that, we do a lot of work around modeling these devices, understanding new how to develop new materials and how to manufacture them. So that's a quick snapshot in terms of some of the research that we do in our research group. Um, but in this talk, we're going to focus on electric vehicles. And uh, just to set the scene, no doubt many people have seen announcements by various governments around the world. In the UK, we've made a commitment to be net zero emission by 2050, which means that you know the UK will not be a net contributor to CO2 moving forward beyond that point. And how that translates into tangible things that are going on, uh, this slide is actually slightly out of date. Um, the UK have announced that they're going to ban petrol and diesel vehicles by 2030. That's 10 years away. That's not very far away. And that's a very bold move. Uh, you can see other countries are making equal uh, commitments. So France proposed to ban petrol and diesel vehicles by 2040. And countries like China, uh, the Netherlands, Singapore, and so on, they've made equal announcements. So we can see the trend of decarbonization cascading around the world whether we can actually reach those targets. Hopefully that's something we can actively discuss because it is a challenging target to achieve. And in terms of road transport, what are the numbers involved you know, in terms of doing this? This, was take, uh, this plot you can see here was taken from a 2010 uh, report by the Grantham Institute of Climate Change here at Imperial. So again, it's a little bit old, but I think it shows some of the numbers that we need to achieve. And what you can see on the left-hand side plot is that back in 2010, if you took the average emissions from a vehicle fleet, uh, we were at roughly 160 grams of CO2 per kilometer. And where we need to be by 2050 in order to avoid irreversible climate change is 20 grams of CO2 per kilometer. Now, through a combination of improving the internal combustion engine, downsizing the engine and making the vehicles more lightweight, we can obviously decrease that uh, carbon intensity and make our vehicles more efficient, but there is a theoretical maximum to how far we can go with that. So if you took a optimized diesel internal combustion engine vehicle, you can probably get to about 20, uh, 80 grams of CO2 per kilometer. And if you hybridize that engine uh, with a battery, so something like a Toyota Prius, where you have a battery which helps you accelerate and decelerate, and uh, helps the engine run at its most efficient point, you might be able to get to about 60 grams of CO2 per kilometer. But that's still a long way away from our 20 grams of CO2 per kilometer. So to achieve that step change in the carbon intensity of our transport, we do need electric vehicles. And in terms of transport vectors which contribute to uh, greenhouse gases, we can see that on the right-hand side plot, passenger vehicles contributes to over half of these emissions. So that's why there's a huge push in the UK to electrify consumer road transport vehicles moving forward. And if we take a look at the UK, this is again slightly old, I need to update these slides, but uh, back in 2016, the UK manufactured about 1.8 million vehicles, nearly all internal combustion engine, 
And if we are going to transition to zero emission vehicles, we, obvious, uh, we want to also transition our vehicle manufacturing to that as well. And we forecast vehicle uh, usage going up in the future. Obviously, that might change. These are forecasts. But um, essentially, by 2040, um, this was an old estimate, we might need over 100, uh, over a million electric vehicles being manufactured in the UK. So that's a huge challenge. And at the heart of it, the battery is the thing that powers these electric vehicles. And the reason why we've seen such an uptake of electric vehicles is because the cost of the technology has come down so significantly in the last few years. The plot you see on the right hand side shows you one key metric that we use. So this is the dollars per kilowatt hour. So the cost of uh, the energy provided. And back in 2005, the cost was uh, over $1,000 per kilowatt hour. And broadly speaking, we need to be below $100 per kilowatt hour to be cost comparable uh, against an internal combustion engine vehicle. And you can see, actually, we've made significant improvements through economies of scale, understanding the technology so we can improve the energy density. And actually, now we're starting to approach that $100 per kilowatt hour number which is why we've seen electric vehicles like the Teslas, the VW ID Freeze, uh, being almost cost comparable and against internal combustion engine vehicles. So we want to make electric vehicles in the UK because the industry supports over 400,000 people. So we also need to make batteries in the UK. And Batteries come from something called gigafactories. Tesla have one of the most famous gigafactories in Nevada, uh, one of the first ones. And that produces about uh, 30 gigawatt hours worth of batteries every year, which is equivalent to about 400,000 um, vehicles, depending on the size of your battery. And right now in the UK, we have, you know, arguably one gigafactory, if not zero gigafactories. So the UK have something called the Faraday Institution, which is our uh, institute to promote electric vehicles and to tie up research with scale up and so on. And we forecast that we will need approximately eight gigafactories by 2040 of varying sizes. Uh, so this is one of the huge targets and huge aspirations of government moving forward. And hopefully we're supporting them doing that. Uh, when you read various reports as well, um, they have all sorts of numbers as we project into the future. So that's what the right hand side shows you about market penetration of these technologies. Some people will say it's very low. Some people say it's very high. It's not my place to say what exactly the number will be. But all I can say is that it's going up. So that's good for um, our research area. And if you look around Europe, you can see the sorts of activity going on. So that's why we call it a battery race right now. Who can make them? Because if you capture that value, then um, there's huge gains to be made over vertical integration of making the batteries and then making the electric cars next to them. And a lot of activity is happening in Germany because they have a very strong auto industry that also wants to transition to electric vehicles. So hopefully that, set, that's, that sets the scene. Battery race is going on at the moment. Now, when we say we want to make batteries, we want to compete against existing technologies. And in the UK, we have set ourselves eight targets that we need to improve the technology by. And these are costs. So I mentioned before that our metric of interest is the dollars per kilowatt hour. And we want to be $100 per kilowatt hour um, at the pack level. So a battery pack is made up of individual cells, but you also have things like thermal management systems, electronics, which support that, and so on. And we're roughly at uh, almost $300 per kilowatt hour at the system level. So that still needs to come down a bit. We need energy density, which is how much energy I have per kilogram or per liter of battery. And that represents the range of the vehicle, right? We want uh, ve electric vehicles to have comparable ranges with traditional internal combustion engine vehicles. And we're at roughly 250 watt hours per kilogram. And we want to double that by 20, uh, 2035. If we can get to 500 watt hours per kilogram, that also unlocks other uh, modes of electrification. So electrification of aircrafts, which are very polluting right now. Uh, power density, acceleration of your vehicle. We basically want to increase that by a factor of four to get uh, higher performance vehicles. But we shouldn't forget that as we put more energy 
into these devices, they become more dangerous. No doubt you've probably seen news reports of flammable phones from Samsung, and we basically don't want that to happen to our electric vehicles. So we want to eliminate what we call thermal runaway, i.e. these batteries catching fire. And we also want to prolong the lifetime of these devices because the resale value is important temperature range as well and predictability if we're going to manufacture many of these. And finally, recyclability, that right now uh, batteries are not very recyclable. Uh, so only about 10 to maybe 50% if you're generous of the battery gets recycled. So we want to hopefully have a circular economy where as a battery approaches its end of life, we can essentially either uh, recycle the elements in there or find second life usages for those battery packs from electric vehicles. So there's still lots of things to be done, but um, you know, scientists are working on it, so don't, don't worry. Now, just quickly, a bit of chemistry. I've tried to make this um, light in terms of the technical content, but it's always nice to see how a battery works. And a battery is almost like a, a Swiss roll, uh, you can imagine it. So you've got a sheet of copper, and then you've got an anode, which is the negative half of our battery. That's normally made of graphite, so the same material as in your pencil. Um, this is porous, so it's got little holes inside. And then we have a polymer uh, separator, uh, which prevents the anode and cathode touching each other. We have a cathode, which is the positive half of our battery. And this is where most of the precious metals are in our uh, battery. So this is normally made of cobalt, nickel, manganese. So the cost of a battery is mostly defined by a scaffold. And then we have a sheet of aluminium. And each one of these layers is maybe 100 microns, so the width of a human hair. And what we do is we stack them up, and then we roll them up, similar to a Swiss roll or a, a toilet roll. Um, when a battery is fully charged, the lithium is in the graphite. So it's soaked into the graphite, or intercalated, as we call it. And when we discharge the battery, the lithium becomes a lithium ion, Li plus, and an electron. And the lithium ion can go through the, uh, the separator via an electrolyte, and, but the electron can't. So it has to go round an external circuit where we can extract useful electrical work like powering lights or electric motors and so on. And then it goes to the cathode where it recombines. So battery 101, that's how it works. And the first generation of lithium ion batteries used a chemistry called lithium cobalt oxide, which Professor John Goodenough won last year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry for. So congratulations to John. But we're now uh, gradually moving away from cobalt because cobalt is very expensive. And the sourcing of cobalt comes with certain, certain ethical questions because most of it is sourced from the Congo, where they call it artisanal mining, but basically small little children pick up the rocks and uh, we don't want that. So we're gradually moving away from cobalt towards nickel. So what we call the NMC chemistries, nickel, manganese, cobalt oxides, which increases the energy density, but also decreases the cost as well. Um, and if we have a look at the industry structure uh, for batteries, you can see these are the key players, right? You have people who produce the raw materials, so miners who collect the raw ores, and then we take that and we produce it into powders, so electrochemistry, uh, which is the precursor for making battery electrodes, which is our battery gigafactory. We then convert these electrodes into the cells that you might be familiar with, where we've got different form factors. So cylindrical cells, prismatics, pouch cells, and they become the basic building blocks for our battery packs, which uh, a Tesla Model S contains about 6,000 individual cylindrical batteries and then that goes into a vehicle. We use that for 10 years or so, and then we have to recycle it. And very few companies vertically integrate because it's very expensive to do that. Some companies do try and do that, but it just gives you a snapshot of what's happening in the industry right now. Uh, now, I just threw in this slide uh, about uh, how do we make better batteries and what's on the horizon. And the things that we care about are the anode, the cathode, and the electrolyte. And uh, what we want for the anode, which is the negative half of our battery, is we want high capacity, i.e. to put lots of electrons into it, and we want a low voltage. So you can see we use graphite at the moment for most of our batteries, but we want to eventually move to things like silicon or pure lithium, but there's problems with that. The cathode, that's where most of the value in the battery is. And 
we've moved away from using materials like lithium cobalt oxide to things like NMC, lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxides. But beyond that, we want to use materials like sulfur because it's very cheap and it has a high capacity um, as well. And maybe in the future, oxygen, because we've got plenty of oxygen. So lithium air batteries um, are a thing, but uh, there's lots of challenges with that. Uh, but this gives you a quick snapshot of the different flavors of batteries, and there's lots of different types out there. Um, but um, my last few slides, because I wanted to quickly blitz through these intro and set the scene slides and open it out to discussion, is just exploring what happens if we uh, put too much energy into these systems. So hopefully this will work and maybe we don't need the audio. But uh, what you see here is a lithium ion battery module and we're overcharging the battery. That's something that we don't want to do. And we cause thermal runaway in the battery where the battery catches fire. So the electrolyte in our battery is flammable. And if we abuse it, either by overheating it, bad things happen. So first of all, you can see that um, it catches fire, but because we've got an oxygen containing source inside the battery, even if we suffocated the battery, uh, it would keep burning because it's got its own oxygen source. We've got um, pressure buildup in the system as well. So you often see these jets of fire kind of coming out from the flames uh, from the battery and also uh, smoke coming off, which some batteries, they also produce hydrofluoric acid, which is very corrosive. So there's huge con um, safety considerations here that you need to think about when you're introducing these battery systems into uh, automotive uh, environments, because we don't want this to happen. So that's bad. Um, and then my last slide, well, last slide of content is just to think about recyclability. Batteries right now are not designed to be recycled because we want to first make sure that they work. But um, increasingly, we are thinking that now that the first generation of electric vehicles are coming to their end of life, what are we going to do with the abundance of batteries, which we're going to be overwhelmed with? Uh, so in the Faraday Institution here in the UK, we are also looking at um, battery recycling where there's different processes. And this map just shows you different types of recycling processes. So you can have pyro metallurgical approaches. So where you use fire, uh, hydro uh, met metallurgical, I can't say that word, approaches where essentially we use chemicals to leach back uh, our nickel, cobalt and so on. The problem here is uh, one, collecting the batteries and two, uh, making it economical to actually do it. So right now it isn't economical to recycle batteries, uh, but these are things that we are thinking about right now. And oh, okay, there was one more slide. <laughs> um, so ultimately the aim is to decarbonize the electrical grid. And we should just be a little bit careful about the bigger picture that what you see here is the grams of CO2 per kilometer are in different scenarios. So on the reference case, we can see a typical vehicle might be 140 grams of CO2 per kilometer. And if you powered your electric vehicle from 100% coal fired electricity, it can actually be worse uh, for the environment if you do the analysis. Um, obviously in the UK, we don't have 100% coal fired uh, power generation. Uh, we often have a blend of natural gas and others. And if we go to 100% wind, it drops down to zero. But this is just a, a warning to just say we also need to think about what our electricity mix is. The UK is actually a leader in low carbon electricity generation. We have lots of wind up in Scotland, not that much solar, but lots of wind. Um, but nations around the world are increasingly decarbonizing. Um, and we should also think about, you know, how big the batteries are as well. In the UK, most trips are under 25 uh, miles uh, daily trip. So maybe you don't need that bigger battery. So we're gonna see a diversity of different uh, electric vehicle types come out in the future. So to summarize, are we there yet? Not quite, but we're getting there. So you can see that uh, energy density and cost of the batteries are approaching mass uptake. So $100 per kilowatt hour. Uh, is what we need, the magic number. There is a race to basically make the batteries here in the UK. Boris is very keen on that and he said it publicly. Um, and we're trying to move to achieve that. We're trying to move away from elements such as cobalt towards nickel, uh, but there's still lots of technical challenges. We need to think about safety and also recyclability of the batteries as well. So that was a um, slightly longer 
uh, then 15 minute overview of um, the current state of electric vehicles. This is our research group, lots of friendly faces here. Uh, I, I don't actually do much research anymore. I just write proposals, do teaching, go to conferences and manage people who do the fantastic work in our group. But uh, hopefully this has um, seeded some questions in the audience, uh, which we can expand on in the discussion with Bill. Yeah, okay, well, that's great. So thank you, Billy, for uh, uh, a very kind of uh, 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 good overview of, of the technologies and the applications and the problem that we're kind of trying to solve in terms of uh, uh, the climate impacts. And it was good to see that you're doing a lot of work with the Grantham Institute. So uh, friends have had quite a few engagements and events with Grantham Institute. Uh, so it's, it's good to see those things kind of being pulled together. Uh, so a couple of things you, you kind of, uh, you mentioned, and it's uh, sparked a few conversations in the chat, it is around the kind of raw materials. Um, so yeah, you mentioned in particular, and uh, Helen has uh, put up a, a chat article about um, the uh, uh, responsible investment in mining. And uh, yeah, there are difficulties in finding, obviously, some of the rare earth materials, not just for the batteries, but also the electric motors. Uh, and also, yeah, things like lith lithium, which is, in, you know, it's, it's quite abundant, uh, but in, in certain parts of the world. So yeah, could, could you maybe just expand on, on the raw material side of, um, of the equation? Yeah, you're completely right that we ultimately want to solve this climate uh, emergency that we got, and it is a real thing, uh, but we don't want to create uh, new problems by creating a solution which is more polluting. Uh, hopefully the last slide talked about where we get the energy from uh, for that, but you're right that we also need to think about the carbon intensity of the minerals that we get. So uh, with uh, key elements like cobalt, in the, uh, the cathode. We don't actually use lithium cobalt that much in uh, electric vehicles. We still use it in things like mobile phones, but most of it comes from the, the Congo where we have ethical concerns, but also the carbon intensity concerns. The challenge is that the global battery industry is very fragmented. So certain minerals like lithium, they are only found in certain locations. So most of it comes from Chile uh, and other South American regions where they use huge salt brine pools where they pump seawater into huge fields and let that evaporate. The problem there is that it's a very slow process to evaporate the water and you can speed it up, but it's very energy intensive. And then you generally ship these materials around the world and that is very carbon intensive as well. So for battery materials, uh, China is actually one of the leaders now in terms of controlling the battery material supply chain. So these things get mined in the Congo, then they get shipped to uh, China where they're processed and then they get processed and then shipped uh, to America where then they're packaged into a battery pack and then they might get shipped to the UK. So you're right, we do need to vertically integrate. That's why in the UK, when we're creating a battery industry, that's one of the things we're thinking about with lithium one of the key mm -hmm. elements, we actually have quite a lot of lithium in Cornwall, mm -hmm. which yeah. uh, lots of the mines which got closed down before because they weren't economical. Suddenly, they're now more economical because uh, lithium is back on the uh, attractive commodities list. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's some of my initial. Yeah, uh, well, that's a good thing. You, you, you mentioned and you kind of touched on it just there about the integration, vertical integration and gigafactories. So well, why, why is it better why is the industry going towards gigafactories for this rather than you know, a relatively small number of uh, those gigafactories rather than larger numbers of smaller factories? Because if you kind of look at traditional automotive at the moment, you'll have an engine plant somewhere in the world and the engines will get shipped out to uh, uh, kind of the uh, assembly factories in, in a different part of the world. So why is it a different, different model for electric vehicles? Uh, so that's a good question as well. It's partly due to one economies of scale. So when we manufacture batteries, there's actually many, many steps. There's mixing of the materials, there's drying of the electrodes, and essentially there's a huge capital cost associated with setting up a gigafactory. Um, Northvolt, which is a Swedish gigafactory, they have received, I think, over five billion pounds worth of funding from the uh, World Bank uh, to kind of support their activities for scale up. So essentially um, you get the cost per kilowatt hour of the batteries they produce drops as the bigger you make it. 
but you mm -hmm. also want to make these factories close to where you make the vehicles because with batteries, they're actually very dangerous to transport. So if you've been flying recently, which maybe not many people have been, um, there's all sorts of notices about power packs that you carry with you and the mo your mobile phones because shipping batteries is actually really dangerous and we have to take all sorts of precautions. So sometimes the shipping of batteries is more expensive than making the batteries themselves if you're shipping them by air freight and so on because you know flying batteries is a huge problem. Okay, thank you. Um, so we, we've talked mainly, well, entirely about batteries, and we got a so one question about supercapacitors. Uh, is it possible that they, you know, how, how will the mix of batteries and supercapacitors work? Mm, so that's a good question. So uh, traditionally in electrochemistry, there's three main devices of interest. There's hydrogen fuel cells, which um, have very good energy density. So you can go very far with them and people are looking at them for things like ships and buses, uh, but they have relatively poor power density. Batteries sit in the middle there, okay power, okay energy. And super caps give you uh, very good power, but very poor energy. And the reality is we can combine them together in hybrid systems and many uh, concept vehicles have demonstrated that. But the reality is lithium ion battery technologies have, has improved so much that they've actually started to approach the power densities of supercapacitors. And in automotive applications, so we work a lot with Jaguar Land Rover, Nissan, and other car manufacturers, is cost is king. So if you can simplify the system, um, then essentially uh, they would always revert to the simpler design. And actually power right now isn't the rate limiting um, uh, factor, mm -hmm. it's uh, energy that they're looking for mm -hmm. and cost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking that kind of regular consumer batteries, yeah, the, the triple A's and the double A's and, and even car batteries, they're all pretty much the same form factors. So I, I can I can buy one off the shelf and plug it in. But it seems that a, the, the current designs of electric vehicles and the kind of the battery packs for those, they're very much kind of integrated and conformal with the body shell. So is, is there any move to some degree of industry standardization? Uh, that's a really good question. So uh, for things like mobile phones and laptops, um, uh, earlier laptops used a type of form factor called the 18650, where they were cylindrical, like a big AA battery. So they were 18 millimeters in diameter and uh, 65 millimeters long. And that was the standard that we use. But the problem is when we go to automotive um, systems, it's quite ineffective to have that smaller cell. We want bigger batteries. So mm -hmm. we're still kind of moving around in terms of standard. Tesla used the 2170, so 21 millimeters diameter. 70 millimeters long and there's actually lots of different shapes and sizes and I think we have kind of standardized across those shapes but inevitably because there are so many other industries that want to electrify now so aerospace shipping that there is no one size fits all so in effect we mm -hmm. want that diversity of shapes and sizes and chemistries. Mm -hmm. Okay yeah, Rod, Rod Rhys Jones has asked a question kind of along similar lines about you know, if they were if they were kind of plug-in styles in terms of shapes and sizes, could they be robotically swapped at a, at a charging station rather than waiting for one to be charged? Uh, yeah, definitely. So recharging time has always been one of the main problems. If you charge your Tesla Model S um, at home from a, fr a free pin plug, you might get three kilowatts out of it and your Tesla might be 100 kilowatts. So you can do the maths in terms of how long it would take. Um, so people are looking at fast charging. Um, and we've got some work with companies like Shell at, uh, looking at battery fast charging. Um, but other people have looked at swapping batteries as well. And there was actually a company in Israel called Better Place, which proposed that and championed it. You could argue maybe they were ahead of their time because it, was a, it makes sense, but the economics at the end of the day didn't work out, so they went bust. But there are other companies now, so electric scooter company, Gokuro in Taiwan, They've got small electric um, scooters running around the city because uh, mopeds are quite uh, popular in Asian countries. And they literally uh, take those out. It's a lot easier because it's a lot lighter. It's the size of a suitcase. And then you plug it into a charging unit and you pick out another one. And that's actually receiving quite a lot of uh, industrial interest. Similarly, a company in China called Neo, uh, who's trying to be the next Tesla, they have a battery swapping service, but I would say it's probably not economical right now to do it. 
Uh, you, you mentioned in the talk, uh, touched on the, the topic of second use. So you have a, a battery that you used in a vehicle, kind of, you know, you've got good performance for a period of time, and then uh, you're going to reuse that for other purposes. Could you maybe elaborate on that? Yeah, so generally we say a battery for automotive applications has reached end of life when it's lost 20% of its charge. So if your electric vehicle had a 100 mile range to start off with, if it only has 80, then that's end of life. And there's still lots of really useful energy in it. So what we want to do is maybe use it for stationary energy storage. So the idea is that in the future, we have wind and solar powering the electricity we get at home. Uh, but these are what we call intermittent energy sources. So the wind blows and the sun shines um, uh, whenever. And we need to store electricity when um, it's not being generated and use it. So the idea with second life batteries is that um, there's still 80% of the energy there to be used. So companies like Nissan, they're looking at the Nissan Leaf batteries, which are coming to end of life, and then putting that onto the grid and getting economic value there. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not quite economical right now to do because you do have to service the pack, repurpose it. And the problem at the moment is the battery cost has come down so aggressively that it's actually cheaper to buy a new battery than it is to use mm -hmm. an old one. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Rob, Rob's asked uh, an interesting question around uh, you know, typical daily trips, as we know, are, are relatively low, you know, 25 miles, maybe up to 70 miles. Uh, but people often want to go on to a longer holiday. So uh, are, are there yeah, potential for, I think they're called range range extenders or additional modular batteries that you kind of load up in the, uh, in the vehicle when you want to go further? Uh, definitely. So essentially, there are some companies which offer those services where you have an additional battery pack that you plug in and gives you additional range. Uh, hybrid vehicles uh, are still have their place in the short term. That's where you have an engine uh, powering um, and charging a battery. Um, but people are also looking at hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, which are coming back into fashion, especially for heavy duty vehicles. Uh, but the hope is that we can improve the charging network and in essentially um, recharge batteries faster. So you might only have 200 miles worth of range, but if you can fast charge in the space of um, 10 minutes, then it's just like using a normal internal combustion engine car. Uh, but there are certain challenges with that in terms of the infrastructure, but it is slowly getting there. Okay. Just, you know, on the kind of uh, more, more political topics, maybe you, know, you, you touched on the prime minister being very enthusiastic, uh, as, 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 it, as is his want, um, for the UK to be a leader in battery production. You also mentioned uh, you know, one of the, the founding fathers, uh, good enough uh, on that. And uh, I think lo looking back at the history of some of the, the original science and technology, you know, the UK uh, at Oxford and at Harwell actually owned a number of the patents uh, and they weren't exploited. Um, so how, so kind of two questions, yeah. How, how can the UK actually uh, maintain a leading position? And, and also second to that, how can we genuinely protect our investment? Mm, great question. So you're right that the original lithium ion battery was arguably invented in the UK. So Professor John Goodenough, who is now at Texas A&M, um, mm. so he was at the University of Oxford when this originally came through. Now, back then, you know, people didn't really care about energy storage and batteries. It, it was seen as more of a novelty. And arguably, because of that, a lot of the innovations got slipped through uh, our fingers. I think now, given that there's a huge industrial interest, so countries around the world are committing to banning petrol and diesel vehicles. So even if we didn't ban them in the UK, uh, those one point whatever million vehicles that we produce, um, we wouldn't be able to export them to Europe because if they have a ban there, that's a huge problem. So at the end of the day, the government do obviously care about the environment, but the main driver is economics. If you can make an economic case, i.e. this is an export product or uh, is supporting jobs, then you know suddenly they're interested. And again, mm -hmm. the UK have made commitments to bring in a UK gigafactory so that mm -hmm. we aren't developing this IP about batteries and then uh, selling it to abroad so that you know we've got a very strong, if you look at per capita, the UK actually has one of the highest 
top universities per capita. I know I'm just pulling out random numbers which make the UK look better, but we do have a very strong research base here in the UK. Um, and essentially, um, we want to have a pipeline so that knowledge can go into UK companies. So that's why we set up the Faraday Institution and the Faraday yep. Challenge, which is 250 million pounds to stimulate electric vehicle startups, companies to invest in the UK. Yeah, yeah. I was reading about the Faraday Battery Challenge. As you said, there's, a, I think the UKRI in their report, they say there's 317 and a half million available on one page. And then on another page, they say 248 million. <laughs> there's, there's a there's a round four uh, closing on the 9th of December. Is that something that you're you're bidding for grant funding from? Uh, yes. So you know we've been reasonably um, uh, uh, well represented in the Faraday. So we are in uh, various projects. So uh, multi-scale modelling. So understanding how batteries degrade. But we also do lots of work with industrial partners. So Aston Martin and a range mm -hmm. of other partners there. Uh, so Innovate UK is great because it allows us to translate some of our fundamental research into industrial output. So mm -hmm. Faraday is broken down into three stages. Fundamental research, so what's the next big blue sky battery uh, technology like solid state batteries or other type of batteries. Um, translation with Innovate UK and ultimately mm -hmm. scale up with uh, something called UK BIC, which is our UK battery scale up and industrialization center. Mm -hmm. So we can take gram scale innovations into ton scale batteries. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so go, going going through a couple of the uh, audience questions, I've kind of been picking on a few as 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 we've had the discussion. Um, uh, I think John John Talbot asked about uh, yeah you know, Dyson James Dyson kind of made the news last uh, was it earlier this year or last year kind of lost track of uh, news time about Dyson investing in, in an electric vehicle. Uh, obviously, there, there are a number of kind of, you know, trade-offs in design. Uh, do you have any kind of perspective on, on what the challenges that Dyson faced in terms of starting from scratch, moving from uh, vacuum cleaners and uh, a robotic vacuum cleaner that we saw at Imperial College uh, <laughs> up, up, to, up to electric vehicles? Yeah, sure. So uh, first of all, a disclaimer that uh, whilst I'm in the Dyson School of Design Engineering, the department was founded from a very kind donation from the James Dyson Foundation, which is mm -hmm. the charitable arm of Dyson. So Dyson, the company is something separate to that. So I am not a representative of Dyson, the company, but mm -hmm. I can comment on what is publicly available information. So that's my <laughs> you know, disclaimer. Um, but essentially, the challenge with any electric vehicle startup, and this is quite a hot area at the moment, is uh, cost. So most of these car companies essentially go for the luxury end of the vehicle spectrum first because you can offer more of a premium uh, mm. there. And it is expensive because you don't have that economies of scale there. So Dyson were des developing an electric vehicle and they very publicly release information about um, the design of that vehicle, which was meant to be, you know, quite a large luxury uh, vehicle. But at the end of the day, whilst it worked, um, they couldn't design it to be economical in terms of at the end of the day, you do it to make money and to sustain activities going forward. I think he's right in terms of uh, many of the components in a um, consumer product like a hairdryer, a vacuum cleaner, to a certain extent, um, they exist in electric vehicles that we have motors, we have batteries and so on. So there are transferable elements, but I think it just highlights the challenge that when you go from a small scale system to a large scale one, there are all sorts of engineering challenges which kind of prop up, which mm -hmm. can really scupper your activities moving forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, Colin Jackson's asked a question about uh, how hydrogen fuel cells stack up as a competitor. I think uh, we've seen parked outside civil engineering, a, uh, I think it's a Toyota vehicle, um, which has got a really nice graphic along the side, yeah, effectively showing the powertrain. Um, so wh where are we in terms of uh, uh, other, other technologies? And uh, I'm, I'm aware there's a, a small company in Wales, River Simple, mm. uh, that have got a very neat, uh, almost in production, but struggling to get there. Yeah, yeah. fuel cell. And we, we've seen fuel hydrogen fuel cells on, on London buses for a while. Mm. 
No, you're right that uh, hydrogen has always been like, it's either batteries or hydrogen. And our research group actually used to be predominantly hydrogen fuel cell orientated, but um, I wouldn't call us mercenaries, but we basically followed the funding trend uh, by the councils a little bit. And now we do mostly batteries, but hydrogen is coming back big time. Um, mm -hmm. So in terms of automotive hydrogen, um, uh, we have companies like uh, River Simple, which is a small company, as you mentioned, in uh, Wales, producing these vehicles. Again, the challenge is making them economical. We do work with a company called Arcola Energy, who are making fuel cell systems for buses. So the UK is actually a leader in making buses, and so double-decker buses, they're very popular, uh, but they're very polluting. So if you've ever been cycling behind a London bus, you can really feel like the, uh, the emissions kind of in your face, as it were. So for heavy duty, um, there is an economic, growing economical case. The challenge has always been costs. Uh, Toyota, you know, Nissan, when I was there, mm -hmm. they've been working on this for decades. But again, that is coming down. Uh, the key thing with hydrogen, though, is that it's a very flexible fuel. So the idea is that in the UK, we have huge amounts of offshore wind potentially coming online in the next few years. If you read the government's 10-point plan about how to address climate change, uh, wind and hydrogen play a big role in that. So the idea is that if you have excess electricity, you can electrolyze uh, water, uh, plenty of that, turn it into hydrogen and oxygen. You can either use that in a fuel cell vehicle, or you can mix it into the natural gas network and decarbonize heat, because that's one of the things that's really hard to decarbonize. We mostly use natural gas at the moment, so methane, uh, which has a CO2 implication. Uh, alternatively, we can also decarbonize other types of industries. So steel manufacturing is actually very carbon intensive because of the coke that we use for the reduction process. And we can use hydrogen in that case to decarbonize steel manufacturing. And then beyond that, again, the government care about the economic case as they should mm -hmm. do. Um, you can turn hydrogen into other um, valuable chemicals like ammonia. You know, you put some nitrogen in there and it becomes an export product again. So what we're seeing is that potentially in the future, we might have these hydrogen hubs around shipping uh, areas where you produce hydrogen, make it to ammonia, maybe ship it uh, somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, I think when we were setting up this call, you, you know, one comment you made that intrigued me was that uh, you know, it, it's easier for the chancellor to tax hydrogen than it is for him to tax electrons. <laughs> that too. So you're right that, you know, ultimately, if we're going to get rid of uh, petrol cars, there's a, if you look at the cost of the petrol that you buy, it's, it's a lot of tax. Um, mm. And if we're all going to move to electric vehicles, it's harder to tax because you could be charging at home. And hydrogen, mm. as an anecdote, um, if you're getting it from the pump, uh, essentially, it's easier to meter and it's easier to tax. Um, mm. Now, they probably won't tax it in the beginning, but eventually they might do. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, uh, we, we're kind of coming to our time. There's a couple of questions around uh, regeneration. So there was a, uh, any, are there any recent innovations in the actual vehicle technology uh, around using braking energy to recharge, uh, which I, I think does happen. Is, is, are there any kind of uh, good developments in that area? Um, so one of the advantages of electric vehicles is that you can recover the braking energy or regenerative braking. And right now, um, we don't actually recover all of it. Uh, we recover most of it. That's because there's actually a huge amount of power you get from braking sometimes. And it damages the battery if you recharge okay. it too fast. So the innovations we've been having are developing faster charging batteries uh, that allow you to recover more of that energy. But to be honest, we're already quite high up on the efficiency numbers there, but every every little bit helps in terms of increasing the range of the vehicle. Hmm. Okay. Uh, um, I think to, just just to wrap up, I'm in, interested in going back to the Dyson School of Engineering. Uh, I think what, what we see in uh, at Imperial, which is always very encouraging, is the kind of multidisciplinary nature of research teams. So could, could you maybe uh, just uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what what the teams are in terms of the kind of the skills and and for people i don't think we've got any uh, students on today but yeah what what are what kind of skills are, are kind of most in demand uh, both from the kind of research area and the commercialization of these kind of things 
Yeah, great question. So just to, a bit of a history lesson, the Dyson School of Design Engineering was set up uh, from our donation from uh, the James Dyson Foundation. And uh, it was really set up uh, from an industrial need that Dyson as a company were, were seeing two types of people coming out of universities. You'd have uh, designers who would make the most beautiful object that you could never manufacture. Uh, you'd have engineers who would make fantastically engineered items that didn't really consider human factors and whatnot. And they would spend a lot of time and energy training each discipline with the skills that they need. So really the Dyson School of Design Engineering, one of our mantras is the fusion of design thinking, engineering thinking within the culture of innovation. So what we want to do is blend both the technical uh, skill sets of engineers. So finite element analysis, computational fluid dynamics, electronics, with uh, design awareness. So considering human factors, enterprise as well. So in our degree, I would say it's, it's different from most degrees that we start off um, much like most engineering degrees with mathematics, materials, electronics, and so on. But most of our degree is structured around project work, i.e., you know, we want to say you learn design engineering, but you do design engineering at Imperial. So it's very project based and very coursework based, uh, which I think is great. Uh, you know, I, I did many exams in mechanical engineering and I can derive many equations which I haven't necessarily all used. Um, so uh, we also have a partner degree with the Royal College of Art, um, Innovation mm -hmm. Design Engineering, which has been going on for much longer. And essentially, I would say, uh, maybe a third to half of those students who graduate from that uh, double masters uh, go off and make spin out companies. So we are very keen mm -hmm. to promote that spirit of entrepreneurship. So hopefully that describes uh, or answers the question you posed about what is design engineering. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I, I've, I've allowed uh, everybody to unmute uh, if, if anybody would like to ask any kind of any final questions. So if, if somebody wants to sort of turn on the video and ask a question, you know, maybe a, a minute or two. And I think uh, Billy, you kindly offered, uh, I think you did, <laughs> offered to uh, uh, host a visit to the, the Dyson School of Engineering, obviously when uh, when we're, we're back into uh, the ability to visit the campus. So it'd be tremendous if we were able to uh, you know, take up that kind of offer um, some sometime through maybe you know, towards the end of next year. Uh, we, we have a fully packed program of events for uh, Friends of Imperial College, so uh, and we, we're keen to get back onto the campus. So uh, I think we, we got quite a lot of questions in the chat. So if, if I could uh, maybe compile them and see if we could provide a couple of written answers if we hadn't addressed all of those, that would be really helpful. I think I'd like to. It's uh, it's it's five to five. And are, are you actually in uh, in your office at the college? I am. So we're doing mixed yeah. mode teaching, so a combination yeah. of in person and online. So today's my in person day. Okay. So I'm I'm, I'm sure you've got uh, other things to do on a Friday evening. But, uh, <laughs> so I think uh, I'd I'd like to wrap up and uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Billy, very much. And uh, we, we're we're all jealous of the blue Peter badge. You said you've got a, a green. A blue peter badge so maybe when we come and meet you, you can uh, you can dig out your blue peter badge and some uh, some uh, toilet rolls and and show us the guitar that was played on blue peter <laughs> definitely i'm, I'm glad i have an audience who appreciates the uh, the value of that blue peter badge <laughs> unfortunately our undergraduate students don't <laughs>